Good morning, Chiefs of Navy, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I'd like to extend my thanks, uh, firstly, to uh, the Royal Australian Navy, and in particular, Andrew Forbes, uh, for inviting me here today to speak to you all. <clears throat> ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to cover sort of four main areas uh, this morning. Um, I'm going to look at the features that combine to make up the energy system, if you like, the petroleum energy system within the Indian Ocean maritime economy. I'm going to look at some of the various challenges which are diverse and quite complex in trying to ensure the security of the petroleum supply in the region. I'm then going to turn to examine some of the target vulnerabilities and assess the threats to the sector at a strategic, operational and tactical level. And then finally, I'm going to consider different possible futures from 2020 outwards and offer some recommendations as to next steps. First of all, I'd like to sort of put things in perspective um, with a few statistics, um, some of which we've heard today, but I'm going to sort of put them in a slightly different way in percentages. Um, as we're many aware, the Indian Ocean covers some 20% of the planet's surface water area. Um, the 36 states that comprise the region have 35.4% of the world's coastline. And as well known, the region is home to the major choke points in the world. All of these following figures are part as a percentage of global trade. So a little over 50% of the proven oil reserves are in the region. 37.5% of the oil production capacity is in the region. There are 49.6% of proven gas reserves in the region, which is um, uh, a very significant quantity, and some 28% of LNG production. The refining capacity, 18.1%, which is almost a fifth of the refining capacity in the world, is, is included in this region as well. So some fairly substantial statistics here to give an idea about how important this is um, and how important it is to, to secure. So when we're looking at what comprises the petroleum sector system in this part of the world, there are six main components, a reserve base, exploration production, export terminals and shipping, sea lanes of, secu uh, um, sea lanes of communication or strategic petroleum streams as I call them, petroleum gateways or petroleum hubs, and the physical markets themselves within the region. Now all of these features require security in their own right and as individual components in order to ensure the security of everything. Um, some can be ensured by state means only, um, such as the reserve bases and the physical markets. Some can only be ensured through international law and collective security, um, namely the sea lines of communication. And the terminals and shipping require both state and industry means to ensure their security. Whilst finally, centers of exploration, development and production require a mix of state, industry, and when necessary, external state assistance. So a few reminders on proven crude reserve base and gas bases. So you can see there at the top, exceptional ones, Saudi Arabia obviously, and then followed closely by Iran and Iraq. And then on the gas front, um, again, exceptional global significance here um, from Iran, Qatar, Saudi Arabia and the UAE on the, on the gas reserve bases. These are things that are go obviously going to be with us um, for uh, the foreseeable future um, and constitute a major focus and have done for many, many years uh, in terms of a, um, the security efforts to ensure um, the security of this source supply, which we'll look at again in, in greater detail. In looking at offshore exploration, development and production, you can see here a graph of the rig counts um, which were taken from about two days ago um, from the region. Um, and you can see still in the Persian Gulf a considerable amount of exploration is going on in their offshore fields there. Also India, which is um, accelerating its offshore production and offshore exploration, um, and a very high rig count there, which is also increasing. Now in the... Um, I'll go back one there. In the pink lines there, you can see the increases um, in, the, um, in the rigs that are going to be applied to the region here. So you can here see Australia, 
Kenya, Mozambique, Myanmar, and over here on the right-hand side, Tanzania, um, are all going to be experiencing dramatic increases in rig counts, which has a big, big impact upon the security that's going to be required for these facilities. And looking at another way of the exploration development themes, if you like, you can see here around the Indian Ocean the sheer diversity and extent of ongoing and future production and exploration. Around here, starting here from the bottom, bottom right-hand corner, the Northwest Shelf and the Timor Sea, and where there is considerable exploration going on um, for natural gas. And then moving around here in an arc here, to, around to the Northwest, the Andaman Basin, the Shui and the Sangu Basins here um, from Myanmar and Bangladesh. And then round here into the Indian littoral, the major bases of the Krishna Godivar, and the, the new regions here of the Shodavri and Manar basins. And then, of course, as you climb around here, you can see here the much more familiar fields here, the major, uh, the major um, Saudi fields of Safania, Zuluf, and Manifa, all holding considerable reserves still, and a great deal of, a great deal of um, exploration going on still in some of these very well-established fields. Now, I've marked down here on this, the east coast of Africa here, an area which is known as the Davy Fracture Zone, um, and the, um, uh, uh, um, the Rift Basin here, the African Rift Basin here. They estimate now a trillion, uh, over three trillion cubic meters of gas reserves. This is gonna become a substantial area um, for production um, in the years to come. And you can see here, I've included two new um, sea lines of communication here, which will be two um, LNG streams going primarily to India and then further east. So you begin to get a feel here that on this east coast of Africa, to join with these other established areas, um, some considerable areas of um, exploration activity, um, which will require monitoring um, and security. In looking at strategic export, the very familiar terminals here in the Persian Gulf, these are in order from left to right, um, of Ras Tanura, Juaymar, Karg, and Jebel Ali, um, decreasing further uh, to the right-hand side of that table. And we still have um, some s a little over six billion export, um, six billion um, annual exports in barrels from this region, about 16 million barrels per day passing through um, the Straits of Hormuz, and which equates roughly to about 10 tankers a day, 10 large VLCCs. And then on this bottom table here, you can see here, this is the LNG craft, key liquefaction terminals here, and these are in order again, Ras Lafan, Dampier, Calhart, and Das Island. So looking at, the, looking at the crude oil on top and the LNG beneath, uh, you can see um, some key features um, that are gonna require constant monitoring and enhanced security in the years to come. In turning to look at what I call strategic petroleum streams, a sort of a variation, if you like, on the, on the sea lanes of communication, um, these, are the, these are the sort of super highways, if you like, of crude, LNG, and LPG. The security is underpinned by a com combination of sovereign state protection and monitoring of territorial waters and EEZs, interstate cooperation, um, for example, in the Malacca Straits and the Malcindo patrols, and then, of course, the umbrella of UNCLOS and the freedom of navigation. The security of these vessels associated with these streams is of national security, not only to exporters, but to importers, but in a wider sense, obviously, the international economic security and the global market. Historically, SPSs have been targeted by states in time of war, terrorist group, criminals, pirates, um, but all for very different motives. You can see here these diagrams, um, like a heat map, if you like, um, the, iron, the iron highway we talked about before yesterday, um, and I've included in here Another one, which is, an, which is going to be a new LNG stream here going eastwards across the Indian Ocean. Um, so this is going to be an area which we're going to have to look at um, when looking at the addition of tonnage in these areas and the way that they converge. And we'll talk about convergence uh, in a little while. A word on choke points. Um, I just wanted to highlight a few of, of this sort of existential, if you like, sort of volumes that are, that are moving through these, through these areas. Um, and the key ones, of course, remain Hormuz down here, 
with 6.1 6 billion barrels a year, and the Malacca Straits at 5.5 billion, and then it to, and lesser amounts here through Suez and Babel Mandab. Some of these, um, some of these uh, routes, of course, have um, no alternatives, but I'd like to point out that in recent years, for example, with the Straits of Hormuz, the addition of the Abu Dhabi crude oil pipeline, which has got a capacity of about 1.5 million barrels a day, are beginning to offset some of the sort of the critical features, if you like, um, of these choke points um, and worth, um, worth bearing in mind. In looking at hubs and gateways, what do they require? What, is it, what does it require to be a, um, a petroleum hub? It requires a strategic location, such as Singapore, massive tank handling capacity and anchorage roads, large refining capacity, and the flexibility to produce and refine different kinds of crudes, which is one of the reasons why Jamnagar, which I'll talk about in a while, has become such an important part of the systemic, um, because um, it can refine some of the more widely available sour crudes. A widespread product and distillate um, network, and then a stable political environment and robust national security to ensure um, that these increasingly important nodes uh, have the security that they require. What are the challenges to that? The security of the streams that, that run to them and from them. Um, this is a vital concern for all, con for all people, the, the markets, the sellers, the buyers. So this brings, into, this brings into sort of context the need for a collective security approach to ensure the security um, of these increasingly important hubs. However, they are an attractive a target um, for saboteurs um, and increasingly for terrorist groups, and something which we'll uh, also cover a little bit uh, later on. And in time of war, these become critical nodes for everybody. Um, in this part of the world, there are three key hubs which we're going to talk about, um, which provide a lot of the product um, for the region. And when you look at this map, ladies and gentlemen, you begin to see how things have changed. In the old models, we used to talk a lot about um, the flow only of crude um, to refining centers um, at the point of consumption. So places like the major Chinese refineries, the ones in South Korea, and in the United States and Western Europe. However, in this region, things have changed now. And what you can see here is three new super hubs here. Um, at Jubail and Abkhaz, Jamnagar in India, and then in Singapore here. And in terms of production capacity here, the combined refining capacity um, in Jubail is now 1.1 million barrels a day. In Jamnagar, which is the world's single largest single site refinery, 1.24 million. And then in Singapore, which has three main refineries, 1.35. And you can see here, um, from the way that the trade lines here radiate out from here, how critical this is to the rest of the world. If you sever these or interrupt it or somehow um, interrupt supply and production at these critical centers, all of the countries along these routes here um, that rely upon refined product and distillate, which cannot refine enough of their own or can't refine any of their own, um, are going to suffer. So this is worth bearing in mind how this has changed and how these three, these three foci um, are becoming increased importance to the region. In looking at the markets, we see that this is a symbiotic relationship. The security of the market is um, as important to the, um, as important to the uh, supplier as it is to the consumer. And market security is ensured in a number of ways. The security of the routes to them, the alliances or trade agreements between the suppliers and the consumers. This is particularly important for the LNG trade, which is largely on a long-term contract basis, although the spot markets are, um, are increasing. Um, but that, those, that kind of relationship, that trade relationship, is absolutely essential um, to the energy and national security of many states. The security of the um, exclusive economic zones and the littorals and the approach waters to those markets, which are largely the responsibility of those states. And, of course, to the security of the terminals themselves, which is a relationship um, and, a, and a sort of cooperative, if you like, between state and the private sector. This reveals, in a stark way, the mutual dependency between the producer and the consumer, not only in the Indian Ocean region, but as we were exploring yesterday, also within the Indo-Pacific region. And you now cannot really divorce the two things um, on this basis. So you can see here the key suppliers down here on the left-hand side and very familiar ones, but also some new ones, um, which are gonna start to become increasingly important um, from about, in about five to six years time, um, namely Mozambique, 
Tanzania, Kenya, and eventually Somalia. It's widely thought in the petroleum industry um, that there is good, um, good structure, good strata off the coast of Somalia, not only for gas, but also for liquids. And one of the things is that everybody wants liquids. There's plenty of gas in the world, um, but new sources of crude in this part of the world um, will be very welcome. And there is some thought that the geology in there will support liquids. Difficult to imagine now that Somalia would become um, a supplier of crude, um, but there are a lot of people now um, giving that some very simple thought, serious thought. In the middle here, intermediate consumers. We've talked about the refineries of India and Singapore. This is where you have the relationships with these countries um, for distillates and products. On the top lines here, you've got crude and LNG, but in the middle here, you've got these relationships where these countries here are working with the major refiners here, and then it bounces back out again here to Kenya and Tanzania, Iran and the Seychelles, a very wide-ranging um, group of, of consumers, some quite, supply, quite so surprising. Iran, for example, um, having terrible trouble at the moment um, refining um, with refining capacity, um, so is a big user um, of refined products. I want to turn now to look at some of the challenges and targets um, and the various threats um, that are, are of interest. So what are the challenges to ensuring security? The region is multifaceted, geographically and thematically. The dispersal of industrial activity, emerging regions that do not have adequate resources um, to support their emerging offshore sector security. East Africa is a case in point. A diverse and unpredictable range of possible threats to security, which we'll talk about in a while. A rather mutable geopolitical, geostrategic realities um, that, are, that are emerging. Complex state and intergovernmental organizations and commercial, co um, commercial sector of cooperation. Sometimes very difficult to articulate where the commercial sector can be involved, although it's absolutely vital that it is. And there are considerable challenges to development of multidimensional collective security architectures that we've been discussing um, since we started our conference in the absence of formalized or cooperative alliances. And this is something which will be a big challenge for this region, um, and I do have um, some, some uh, ideas on this one, um, which I'll present at the end. So in terms of looking at geopolitical and geostrategic realities and possibilities, you've got the increasing international oil and gas investment in East Africa and the Indian Ocean small island developing states. This will lead to extra regional state interests from Europe, the United States, and China. They now have um, reason to be even more interested and more concerned about the security of the exploration and production regions in areas which are now emerging. So something, uh, something to bear in mind. But again, particularly with regards to the coast of India, the east coast of Africa, and now also in the Bay of Bengal. Expansion and extension of Indian naval power projection in the region and influence throughout the wider Indian Ocean region. Chinese expeditionary naval development and deployment and protection of its, inter of its interests much further to the, to the east, sorry, to the west. Potential reintegration of Iran into the regional international arena, both politically and commercially. And of course, the long-standing triangular interpower relationship between Iran, Iraq, and the Gulf Cooperation Council states, which will always be with us. And then finally, something that's being talked about quite a lot these days, um, as the geopolitics of the petroleum world is changing with the dramatic increase in US reserves, um, both um, in terms of crude and particularly in terms of gas, is that this is changing the pattern of petroleum geopolitics in the world, and it's making them much, much more self-dependent. That will only increase over time. So having said that, there's been some talk that their interest in the region would therefore diminish because their, their reliance upon it would decline. I would argue that that is not the case um, and that the US will have a, a flexible and adaptable response to crises in the region. It's in, very much in their interest to ensure market stability and security for obvious reasons. So in looking at threats to the sphere, and we can see that there has been a, very much a past, a present, and a future, and um, they're all quite interrelated um, in, that, in that sense. In the past, um, we've seen major war threats um, to the, shipping, to the uh, tanker shipping community in the form of the tanker war, terrorist attacks against the, the VLCC Limburg, attacks against the Iraqi oil terminals, 
Uh, in 2010, July 2010, we saw an almost extremely successful attack against the Japanese flag tanker, M-Star. AQAP are repeatedly attacking the pipelines leading to um, their only LNG terminal and are actually now attacking and probing the terminal itself. And then traditional piracy problems and territorial disputes. And of course, we've had a range of international sanctions um, which have been applied to the region as well. In the present, there is an extant maritime terrorist threat, um, predominantly now from AQAP and Lashkai Taiba. I'll talk a, a little bit about them uh, uh, later, later on. Somali hijacking and piracy is still there. The skill sets are still live. There is a, there is, it's been greatly reduced, as we know. Um, however, um, there is a legacy of experience there, and there is definitely the capacity to revitalize that um, should they want to. The Persian Gulf, its geopolitical fragili fragility, and then intrastate conflicts in Egypt, Iraq, Yemen, and Somalia are all part of the present landscape. And then finally, some territorial disputes which have been with us for many years between Iran and the UAE. Now, in looking at the future, a possible Somali pi piracy resurgence, non-Somali -pirac non piracy in the Bay of Bengal, intrastate conflict, interstate conflict, perhaps difficult to imagine, but certainly um, the possibility exists sanctions and blockade, and then ongoing territorial disputes. One interesting one that will, um, that will emerge um, and is between Kenya and Somalia. And as these two countries start to probe and explore their littorals um, for oil and gas, the demarcation between the countries is now being sort of thrown into sharp relief and something that, uh, that we'll need to think about. So in looking at security threat and vulnerability, we've got an interesting paradox has emerged here um, of great separation in terms of time and space across the Indian Ocean region and um, between areas of activity. And yet we've got some problems of threat convergence and threat and target convergence in certain areas. You can see here the traditional um, lines of communication, products and distillates, which I've indicated before, which are reflect reflected in some of the crude streams as well. I've, I've added here the new LNG, LNG streams here going eastwards. And then in these shaded areas here, you see areas of convergence where there'll be greater exploration and production here. And interestingly here also, um, there is um, a great deal of thought going into the offshore um, exploration potential in the Gulf of Aden. The petroleum systems here that lead up here um, through, the, through the African Rift Basin and then leading down south here from the Arabian Plate um, do give rise to good petroleum geology. So there is thought here that there could be some interesting opportunities here for offshore exploration. The traditional one here in the Persian Gulf, and then here off the west coast of India, the Bay of Bengal, and then of course you can see a convergence here um, where you've got multiple lines of um, product and LNG streams intersecting here and with increasing exports coming up from Australia. So you begin to see some potential future hotspots here um, of where there is a sort of a, a, sort of a, a more, more targets available um, which also are intersecting with areas where there's going to be need, extra need for conveyance in that part of the world. The industry, the offshore sector industry and the oil industry, and um, to an increasing extent, the shipping industry, looks at risk um, in the ways that they do business. And I've drawn up here a table with regards to the industry of the targeting complexity and the consequences um, of the sector. So comp complexity here up the left-hand side and then consequences down here on the base. And you can see that the different, the different facilities, the different kinds of targets fall into different spheres. So for example, here in the extreme top right-hand corner, the mobile offshore production units and FPSOs are the most complex to reach, but if you were to target it successfully, it would have the greatest consequences here. You only have to think back to Deepwater Horizon um, and the extraordinary um, effect that had on the American Gulf Coast. And you begin to see that if you were to successfully target a facility of that nature and targeted an area which didn't have very much resource to cope with that kind of attack, um, the kinds of disasters um, which would result from that. Closer, in here, closer inside here onto the bottom left-hand corner, offshore support vessels and seismic survey vessels, easier to reach, easier to attack, part of the sector, but the consequences of attacking them um, are far less than others. 
Over here to the, um, to the right-hand side, VLCCs, if you were to target them successfully in, actually in, a, in a much more catastrophic way, they're easy to reach and they're easy to attack, and we only have to look at piracy statistics to prove that. But the consequences of destroying a VLCC in, in sensitive waters, um, in, sea, in sea lines of communication, or near fragile coasts, um, and in pilotage waters would be considerable. Many of these targets, of course, have been, um, have been attempted, VLCCs, coastal terminals are being routinely attacked um, in Yemen. Coastal processing facilities and refineries have been attempted in Abqaiq in Saudi Arabia in 2006. Um, what has been left at the moment um, uh, is are the sort of the more inshore drilling rigs here, the, what we call the gravity rigs. Um, the complexity of reaching them um, is slightly less than the, um, the deeper offshore drilling units, the drill ships and the platforms. Uh, but we have yet to see um, any, uh, any attempts at these, um, I'm glad to say. So in looking at threat examples, at the strategic level here, we can see that the effects of an interstate war um, on the sector here, um, which were characterized um, by the Iran-Iraq war. And attacks on both sides res resulted in 540 attacks um, against shipping, with some 324 merchant seamen killed. The Tanker War was the most intense assault on merchant shipping since the Second World War. Um, however, interestingly, despite the campaign, which was a strategic campaign by both sides to target shipping, um, they, they never actually really achieved their aims in terms of stopping the flow of oil, which was a result at the time of there being a great deal of oil on the market. Ironically, the intensification of tax following international intervention and the introduction of convoys um, against and uh, the US campaign against Iranian, uh, Iranian forces saved vessels and eventually ended up or precipitated the ending of the conflict. At an operational level and, and slightly more recently, following the um, AQI attacks on the uh, Iraqi terminals at Al Basra and Khor Al Amaya, there was a concerted international effort um, by Australia, the UK and the US to protect these terminals. Um, in the forms of CTF-158 and then later CTF-IM. And this set the standard as to how you would do that, how you would protect terminals of this nature. But this was the first maritime attack of this kind, and it's not been duplicated since, but it has proved that its effectiveness. The attacks themselves didn't result in too much damage. One of the reasons was, is that they didn't get close enough, and there were, at the time, there were no, um, there were no tankers moored alongside here. You can see a tanker moored alongside here, Abbott. Um, had that been the case, that the damage might have been um, much, much more spectacular. At a tactical level, terrorist attacks against VLCCs. Um, on the 28th of July, 2010, there was uh, an attack against the Japanese-owned tanker um, MVM M-Star, a two-boat attack in the, near the Straits of Hormuz, just to the west of it using a two-boat uh, WBIED, waterborne improvised explosive device. And the group responsible was Abdullah Azam Brigades, exceptionally brazen a complex attack against a vessel which was full away at night and a vital petroleum choke point. And had this attack been successful, would likely have not been one of the most successful attacks in history uh, and would have had very, very far-reaching um, implications had the vessel, had the vessel foundered. You can see here the damage to the starboard side here um, in the aft area near the engineering spaces. If that would have been to breach, if that had breached the, fl the, the hull there, uh, that would have flooded the engine room um, very, very quickly, and she likely not would have foundered. On the hijacking side, um, the petroleum industry has been heavily affected in that way. Many, many tankers attacked during the course of um, the piracy problem. And um, this was a vessel that I was involved in helping uh, to bring back from capture, the motor vessel Smyrny, and pirates armed with the usual array of weapons, AK-47s and RPG, and in this case also heavy machine gun. And um, interesting, there was no security team embarked. It was a flagship, um, flagship vessel, this one. And she was held off the coast of Puntland for 10 months before um, payment of ransom. And at the time of release, some 300 pirates on board who are um, expecting their pay. This proves that the, the skill sets, the pirate attack group skill sets, very much alive um, and something to be borne in mind when looking at the sector. So finally, looking at sort of possible futures here, 
I've looked at two scenarios here. Future A is resource imbalance and overstretch. So when we consider concurrent security crises, um, threat to shipping in the, in the high-risk area, regular terrorist attacks against coastal facilities in Yemen, terrorist piracy evolving in the Gulf of Aden and Somali basins um, in the increase of production off the east coast of Africa, heightened interstate tensions in the Persian Gulf and Gulf of Oman, and then a resurgence in terrorist attacks or terrorist activity by LET, which has a very, very competent maritime cadre. And if we look at the challenges here, East African Navy's low on sufficient resources for long-range patrol, vessels, corvettes, and maritime domain awareness. Yemeni Coast Guard desperately short on numbers of suitably armed vessels and C3I. Reduced numbers of warships from the international community to patrol critical areas like the IRTC and the Horn of Africa. Limited number of replenishment at sea vessels um, to support long-range and expeditionary maritime security operations. And the ability to monitor properly sea lines of communication as they converge towards critical hubs and the choke points that I pointed out. And then interestingly, a lack of response, uh, robust oil spill response capacity. Future B, concurrent security crises are the same, but this time we've got assistance to East African navies, international support for the Yemeni Coast Guards, supporting multilateral provisions to ensure extra regional naval support in times of crisis, a procurement program um, to help the GCC um, procure its own vessel replenishment so that they can um, support their own high-tempo maritime security operations as required, and then adopt greater development and utilization of navies in joint constabulary roles um, for routine maritime security operations in East Africa. I'd like to finish, ladies and gentlemen, with some recommendations Listed down here, just a few of them I want to point out, build upon the work and fast accelerating legitimacy and um, the sort of importance achieved by IONS to, encar to encourage IORA to lead further in helping understand the petroleum sector and what it takes to, to, to secure it. Embrace regional security risk analysis and the risk management approach um, that was mentioned yesterday, to, suggested in this symposium, to better understand the security risks in the region and how we might better allocate resources judiciously to tackle them. And then to encourage a sort of a two-layered um, dialogue um, at, the multi at the major power strategic level with um, strategic dialogue and confidence building measures. And then at a second tier level, understand um, mission, put together mission specific bilateral agreements um, between various navies. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm gonna pause there um, thank you very much indeed.